So thanks for joining me today. I'm looking so forward to this conversation. Um, you know, and, and we've worked together in the past. You've been gracious enough to invite me to your events, but, um, Mayan, can you introduce yourself and, and, and a bit about Tom? Sure. Thanks for having me, Bryce. I'm really excited to be here. Um, so my name is Mayan Karen. Uh, I am the director of Tom University, which is basically, um, well, maybe I'll tell you a little bit about Tom and then what I do, and then uh, it'll be clear. Uh, Tom is a nonprofit venture. It stands for Tikkun Olam Makers. And it's basically a global network of communities that create open source affordable uh, solutions or products for uh, neglected challenges, meaning uh, challenges or products that don't have, that don't exist on the market, uh, either because uh, what exists on the market is unaffordable, very expensive, or because it's just such a niche uh, problem that there's no uh, business model around it and nothing was created uh, to answer this need. Uh, we work with people with disabilities mostly and with uh, the elderly. Um, and we really try to create a framework in which we uh, basically co-create solutions between the people that have this neglected challenge. We call them need knowers because they are the authority on their need. They have the knowledge and the expertise and what they want and uh, you know what their challenge is. And on the other hand, the, the makers, which is a catchphrase for a, a lot of different people, engineers, designers, uh, occupational therapists, physical therapists, and anyone who has a creative mind and good hands and can actually create solutions. Uh, we do a lot of hardware solutions, actually. Uh, we do some software and hardware solutions, and we're getting into the whole software world. Uh, and everything that we do is open source and available on our uh, online platform at tomglobal.org. And it allows anyone anywhere to have access to the designs that were created by our communities, uh, to download them and build them themselves, or to even order them from a community that has a manufacturing space. Um, and that's it. We've been around for 10 years and we're active in uh, over 30 countries over these 10 years. Uh, one of our biggest uh, communities exists on campus, on campuses in universities, because we really believe that universities are the perfect ecosystems for Tom communities. They have dedicated students that really want hands-on projects that have real impact, which is very important to them. All the work they ever do is uh, very theoretical and ends up on their hard drive. It never really amounts to anything that helps a real person. Um, they have all the skills and expertise of the uh, of the uh, staff and the faculty at the uh, university or a higher education institution. Of course, the manufacturing capabilities, uh, almost every college and university in the States have some sort of a makerspace or fab lab or a 3D printer somewhere uh, in a corridor. Um, and lastly, they have the connection with their own community. So we have this uh, global model where all our local communities help their own need knowers in their immediate surrounding. And then because everything is uploaded to our platform, it reaches everyone around the world and they can potentially help someone, on, you know, someone in California can help someone in Singapore uh, and so on. Yeah. I mean, the work that you all do is incredible. I mean, it reaches just, it's just really in, like awe-inspiring in a lot of ways. And, you know, I really appreciate what you're saying about the desire of sort of young designers and engineers to want to, to do something real and make a difference in the world. But I also even more so appreciate the emphasis on the need knower, like within your practice, because I think, you know, for better or for worse, it's really natural for someone to have an idea and then go solve it. And then, but they're not necessarily really deeply in tune with, as you said, the people who are the real experts in their own needs. And so the fact that the, the need knower is so intrinsic to your process, um, you know, just really speaks to this, to the idea of nothing about us without us. And the fact that you bake that in so much in, in how the whole process works, you know, is really wonderful because I do know that the students get more out of it. And I've been involved with, um, 
things that are similar to what you do just on uh, local campuses that don't have that need knower aspect and you can see how it goes awry you know oh yeah i was just at a campus here i'm in israel right now and i was on a campus here today presenting uh for a global competition that we're about to have and someone comes to me and shows me a cup holder that they 3d printed and they said it's for someone without fingers and they did it as part of a course uh where they were learning how to use a 3d printer and how to 3d model things and they show me and they're very proud of it and i said oh great who's gonna use it and they're like oh we don't know like we just designed it right. i said well you know that's it's you know, 95 or 98 percent of the projects are like that uh, in the academia space. And it's it's really crazy to think about all the needs out there that don't meet uh, these solutions or are not created with these solutions in mind because, you know, the focus is on training and teaching rather than on actually uh, doing that, you know, purposeful work that has, uh, you know, some sort of a a way to to become something real in the world and to actually go out there and, and create impact, you know? Um, and that's definitely something that we are very proud of, of doing. And I think you see it with everyone that gets involved with Tom. Uh, the, that is where the spark happens is when you work with the need knower and you go through this process and at the end of it, yeah, they get a nice prototype or a product to take home, but what was built in the, you know, in this process between them, the feeling of uh, inclusion of everyone and the feeling of meaning and purpose is as important as the product that was built during the process. Yeah, I mean, absolutely. It feels like there are aspects of the craft that are taught and aspects of the craft that that aren't taught, right? And, and so I do appreciate, I mean, just to tell you kind of a personal story of, of how how I've seen this gone awry in various ways. Um, you know, uh, we, we had a local, we had a local kind of like design night at the university of Washington where a bunch of their assistive technology, um, engineers, like folks who are basically in a club to build assistive technology did a, did a challenge. And the challenge was to, was that there was a hypothetical individual that was missing fingers. That was a guitar player. And they recently lost some fingers and they needed a way to, to play guitar with, without the fingers. And what I found really fascinating was that every one of the students went about designing prosthetic fingers and no one went to redesign the guitar. And it just kind of goes to show how these solutions can go in certain directions when you don't have that intimate knowledge of the community. Like no one even bothered to ask if this guy even wants to wear a prosthetic finger, right? You know, so, you know, I, so again, I super appreciate like how, how your folks have, have got about it. And there is an actual person in most of these design challenges that you do. Um, yeah, it's just wonderful. So it, you had an event recently. Um, do you want to talk a bit more about that? It sounds really cool. <laughs> <laughs> Absolutely. Yeah. Um, we have events all the time, <laughs> uh, but we we had an event last night actually, which basically um, summarized all our work, specifically in Israel uh, in 2023. Uh, we started doing a lot of uh, longer processes with uh, uh, development teams, where we basically put together teams that have um, um, different expertise. So we, we another thing we really try to put emphasis on uh, aside from having a need knower involved in every process is to have an interdisciplinary team that includes both engineers and designers and uh, paramedical experts uh, or professionals, because we really believe that, like you said, like the example you just uh, talked about with the guitar, um, if you put, you know, in one room, only engineers that are trying to solve a problem and in the next room, only designers that are trying to solve the same problem, you'll get completely different solutions and probably none of them will fit the person that needs it. But right. when you combine all of them in one room, um, then you start creating uh, this conversation that leads to the best approach. And so what we did uh, is uh, create these teams around specific challenges um, and they had five months to work on, uh, you know, using our methodology of development on uh, creating a product. Um, and last night we uh, showcased all the products that were built um, 
And uh, it was really amazing to see the work done uh, on these products. I could tell you uh, one really neat uh, product about, uh, we did a lot of kind of accessible parenting projects, which is really nice. Uh, so one of them is a woman who uses crutches and she recently had a baby. She's by, by the way, a Paralympic swimmer. So she's an athlete. Um, but she uses crutches and she was very concerned when she became a mother that she wouldn't be able to, um, go around with her stroller, uh, because she has to hold the crutches and she didn't want to use a wheelchair. And she looked in the market and she did some research to see what solutions are out there. And she saw that there aren't many solutions and especially not for crutches. There might be some solutions for wheelchairs, but also kind of not very smooth. And so we put together a team and they created this belt for her that she puts on her waist. It's almost like the, the, the bottom of a baby carrier, you know, this, uh, this, this uh, wide belt that adjusts to her waist that has two springs, very kind of um, flexible springs that are very strong that attach, uh, like clasp the uh, stroller handle and allow her to just move with it when she's standing. Um, I'll share a video with you later. Uh, it, it's it's wonderful. And you can just see she's walking around with it in her apartment, on the beach, everywhere she goes. And she said it just allowed her to become a parent that she wanted to be and she envisioned, you know. Um, so this was one of the products that was made. And uh, we brought all the volunteers and all the partners together. Uh, we had it in the art museum. So it was part of the arts in the museum. And it was just beautiful to see the human connection that was formed throughout the process and to really see that this is a model that can be also scaled and done in different places you know using students using professionals using people in corporations you know microsoft you have so many people that want to volunteer their time instead of painting houses or working at a soup kitchen maybe they can create products for people you know um, so this is the idea that we're trying to scale is how to create this sort of work only you know, using many people in different places and then solving more and more challenges. There's, there's so much I want to get into there I, I mean, <laughs> in the, in the therapist thing for a minute, because I think that could be really rich for us to talk about some of the challenges there. But I think one of the things that you're describing, which I think is really important to, to consider when you're, when you're working, when you're engaging directly with the community is, is not only their capacity, but what they want. And I think Traditionally in assistive technology, you were prescribed a technology and, you know, this is what you got. And if you didn't like it, sorry, this is what's available. And that's why assistive technology abandonment rates are so high, right? So I, I think what the scenario that you described around the fact like she didn't want to use a wheelchair, I'm assuming also possibly not a walker. You said specifically crutches. So mm -hmm. cool. And so you, you solved for that. And, and it makes me think of other really great innovations that are out there in the world that I just have trouble with, like in, in a sense of trying to fit them to certain people. So there's some, um, there's some earplugs that are available right now that filter out certain frequencies for individuals with autism. They're wonderful devices, but for the individuals that I encounter that probably have the highest need for those, for that type of solution, they don't want to wear something like an earplug, like, you know, like they just don't want anything on their body. They don't. And so, you know, you know, I, I'm not, that's not a criticism of any of these solutions. It's just a reality that we live in, right. Of all of yeah. this. Stuff. Also, when you think about kind of mainstream design, you know, and how it was formed, it was all the design you see out there, all the options of, you know, shoes and, and just like, you know, furniture and things, it, it was all created for the mainstream, so to speak, you know, yeah. uh, which is, I hate to say it, but male, uh, white, um, between 18 and 40, and all the kind of outliers, outliers, uh, which are women, or people who use glasses or anything else, you know, um, really, uh, did not fit these uh, typically designed uh, models, you know, and I'm saying when you look at, uh, you know, assistive technology, uh, you see that the choices are very limited. It's usually very, you know, looks like medical devices, it's gray or neutral. It's not very appealing. And people who want to use these, even glasses, you know, if you look a few decades ago, you know, right. what type of glasses you had. I mean, today I'm wearing these like cool glasses and I love them and they're an accessory, but you know, a, a while ago, there wasn't that choice because, you know, it wasn't 
uh, perceived as a mainstream object, you know. Mm -hmm. Now every other person has glasses, so obviously there's a bigger market. And I think this is also one of the, you know, um, kind of problems uh, when we look at assistive technology versus inclusive design mm -hmm. and how do you basically, you know, bridge and balance between the need to create options and things that are tailor-made to the tastes and the needs and the, you know, and the desirability of people who have different needs or certain needs that are not mainstream and still ensuring that, you know, there is uh, the ability to answer these challenges without creating this subculture of, you know, devices that are ugly and undesirable. <laughs> So, yeah. you know, we, we talk about that a lot as the, the sort of stigmatization of medical equipment. Right. And your glasses example is the canonical one that we use. Like, how come glasses are widely accepted now, but hearing aids and canes are not? And you can kind of see a path to where hearing aids could could go. I mean, people wear earbuds all the time. It, you know, even when you're talking to someone, it's not unusual now to them for them to have their earbuds so how do we get to a place where we can normalize and, and and even beyond normalize like make into desirable objects a lot of these a lot of these things yeah it's 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 a fascinating space i will tell you when the adaptive controller came out we 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 leaned into that quite a bit we wanted to make a device that felt part of the family of of xbox devices that was very important to us but we got a lot of really good feedback from the from our, our partners around making sure that we weren't stigmatizing. And we've thought about that a lot since then. And I think, I, I think that's another thing that's important to, to work with not only the makers of these technologies, but also like the communities that eventually use them. It is really uh, easy right now to pick an assistive technology based off its feature set they are typically more money than your average consumer product. So you do want to get value for that money. So I understand why a consumer wants to get the most features they can. But I will tell you in, in my work over many years, most of the people that buy these things, they, they don't invest either the time or the cognitive load is too great to actually learn everything that this assistive technology does for them and incorporate it into their life. And that's one of the things that leads to abandonment. So there is mm -hmm. a larger, there's a larger process, which I think I mentioned in, in the booklet, uh, devices, accessories, augmentation that we're thinking about, that it's not only about making the product, it's about how that product exists in people's lives and how do you get that knowledge out into the community, which is, you know, again, why I love your organization so much because you are so entrenched in a community across the globe. Yes, and, and I I connected to a lot of the things that were written in the booklet specifically about, you know, um, that need to create awareness and to uh, basically use success as an example to show others. I think this is one of the challenges that we also have uh, of, you know, breaking that barrier between helping people and, and, and you know, working with people uh, in different communities and being able to really scale the work in a, in a way that many people know they have access to these options, you know, uh, and I think that the work that you're doing is wonderful in that sense is really making it, I don't want to say cool, but it is cool, you know, it's cool. It's something that is a part of daily life. It uh, enables and enhances people's lives. And when it works, it works and it needs to be, you know, something that people are aware of. Um, and, and that's, you know, part of the thing that we're also trying to do is to uh, use this awareness piece to really, um, you know, to really share the message with the world. Um, and, you know, it's something we're working on. And I think that when you see these success stories, they're very, um, you know, they're amazing. I, there's one story I love telling. It's, it's kind of more about... The inspiration part of it but i think it's it's um i think it to me it really you know kind of captures the the essence of what we do is uh um so a couple of years ago i was at a makeathon in vanderbilt university which has really one of our most amazing communities um of tom and one of the need knowers and one of the teams was a 12 year old girl who was uh, uh she was homeschooled and she uh, had autism and she needed some sort of a device for the bath. Um, and she 
you know, worked with a group of engineers and they created some solution for her. And then at the last day I interviewed her and I asked her, how was the process? And she said, um, you know, I like the device and it's great, but uh, what I really realized from the process is that I want to go and study engineering when I grow up. Right. You know, and, and because she realized like that, you know, they helped her, but her ability as a 12 year old who was homeschooled to interact with these 20 something year old engineers and designers and just be an equal part, it really gave her a sense of self and of awareness of what the possibilities are, you know? And to have her come out of it thinking, oh, I can be an engineer, I wanna be an engineer because I wanna help others. To me, that's something that, as I said before, it goes beyond the actual prototype you take home, you know? It creates this awareness of what is possible, you know? Yeah, I mean, absolutely. And, you know, uh, the, the, the awareness is really important. I think for us, um, we, we often, you'll see a difference. I'm sure you experience this too, where someone who is born with a disability versus acquired it through accident or, or whatever, they have different ways of approaching things. So we would get a lot with the adaptive controller. We'd get a lot of vets early on who were limb different, who come up to us and they'd go, well, I need a one-handed controller because I only have one hand. And our response to them was stop telling me what you're missing and tell me what you've got, right? And think about how do you approach this problem beyond just your hands? Like do you have feet, do you have elbows, do you have head? Let's let's talk about other inputs there. And 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 that's a part of awareness because those individuals who are so used to, you know, this way of what a game controller was could only think about it in context of what they were missing and what they, they used to do versus what they do now. So, so building that awareness across that community is super important. Yeah. I, I, this reminds me always of, you know, the social model of disability and how it talks about how society is really creating the barrier, right? You're used to thinking about something in a certain way because this is how society built it with the controllers or with like stairs, you know, or whatever it is, it's actually creating the disability in a sense, because it's, creating a barrier, you know, and I think that this is the the mindset that we have to really work around. Um, we created a wonderful product recently um, that kind of talks about that as well. Uh, we created a, a nurse call button for a, a big hospital here in Israel that is adaptable and it allows people with, uh, uh, you know, without limbs or with different disabilities that are not able to actually do the pressing of the to use anything, their head, their elbow, their feet, you know, and it's just a 3D printed knob that you attach to the existing system. And one of the interesting things about this project is that it's, you know, I, I always feel like the the uh, nurse call button is kind of a nuisance for the nurses, right? Because you, um, you know, they, they, you know, they, they're very busy and every time somebody calls them, they have to, you know, put aside what they're doing and go. But actually this project proved that you know, this is a need that came from them, from the medical staff. The need knowers for this project were actually the nurses and the staff and not the patients. And they showed that this thing exists. And not only that, they were also very vocal about the need to uh, attach it a certain way to the bed and make it, um, for example, very easy to maneuver and put it, you know, higher or lower depending on the patient. And so they were such an integral part of the process um, and I think it's just amazing to see how, you know, these products are created, uh, when there's, you know, all these considerations around, not all, you know, that kind of break down the barriers of what you think is possible and what you're so used to seeing, you know, in so many like institutions and kind of rethink it. Yeah. And, that, and that's a great segue to get back to that OT conversation that we're talking about. And I think, and I think one of the challenges that we see, um, so let me tell you, one of the things that, that I see a lot here, we work with a lot of OTs. We love the OT community. Um, our engineers really respond well to professionals like therapists, you know, OTs, which is great. And when you work with the OT community and when you work with like a speech language pathologist, you, you get you get the insight from everyone that they've ever worked with, right? But there is a little bit of a trap in the sense that that they still are um, engineers and OTs still come from a, like a clinical engineering solution based perspective, meaning what's the problem? What's the fix? What's the problem? What's the fix? And that's where we always try to re-inject some design and, and, and need knowers back into it. Like, great. You talk to some OTs, 
absolutely they're, you're going to get good insight but don't don't assume that they're going to give you the, the exact answer either you always still have to bring in some actual people with disabilities to to really get that insight um you know which I think is super important. And we have a tons of, of stories that, that I, I just watch engineers. I mean, whenever I uh, introduce engineers to, to occupational therapists, it, there's certainly a ton of magic there that happens. But I always have to like kind of go, hey, well, we're going to actually go back and make sure that this works with the actual people that we're, we're intending this for. Um, so I don't know. Does that resonate with you at all? Oh, yeah, definitely. I mean... It happens all the time. And I think that, you know, uh, one of the things that we try to really emphasize when we talk about our process and we teach the students how to do this process and how to start is don't try to focus on a solution first. You know, don't come with a solution in mind. And actually, we say that to the need knowers as well, because it's very easy to come to the table and say, I need a device that does X or I need a thing that does Y. No, focus on the challenge on what you you do and you want to improve or what you like you said you don't do and you want to fix focus on the challenge because you might come up with a direction that you didn't even think about you know um like you said is it a prosthetic finger or is it a adaptive guitar you know um so i think that uh focusing on the solution first kind of captures you into this mindset that then it's really hard to break away from um and and it's something that people just do very automatically you know it's very easy to to think like that and to talk like that and so we really try to break that pattern um and like i said before the more uh voices you put in the room with more perspectives the messier it gets but at the same time this mess creates some sort of an organized kind of you know process and at the end of it you get to something that usually um you know, has a, a lot of considerations put into it, both from the side of the need knower and the clinical side and the engineering side and the design side. And then you can start thinking about how this thing looks. Some of our products went through a lot, a lot of iterations. And that's kind of one of the things we're also trying to figure out is when done is done, you know, and I'm sure that you also have this problem is when do you oh, yeah. complete a process and you say, okay, moving on, you know, like this is what it is. And one of the examples is, uh, well, there's there's two kind of main examples, but I think the the one I want to share with you is the uh, is the printed prosthesis that we're doing uh, recently, and now we're working a lot with it in Israel. And this came from uh, actually a need knower that had a kind of a bionic prosthesis. It was really expensive, and it was uh, electrical, and it did all these things, but he didn't like it. It was too heavy, and he couldn't like cook with it. You know, in the evening when he just came back from work, and he just wanted. Uh, a pajama prosthesis. This is what he asked for. Right. And this is how this prosthesis was born, you know? So we created this 3D printed prosthesis that has uh, a- an end piece that could just click in and out. Um, and depending on the need and the function that uh, he wanted to do, we created different end pieces that would fit in. And so this product kind of traveled the world to different places, to Singapore and then to the US and then back to Israel and then different places with different people different needs, different size arms, all amputated below the elbow. That was the only thing they had in common. And then we realized that this product really needed to be parametric so that we can, you know, easily just customize it to whoever needs it. And it'll be something that, you know, can happen relatively fast instead of reinventing the wheel. And this is where, you know, it started to really create magical things. And you you really saw this as part of what we also showcased yesterday is that, you know, this can be something that helps someone who was born without a limb play basketball all of a sudden because he had the arm that can, you know, dribble and then, you know, shoot. As someone who used to surf and couldn't surf because uh, he was amputated, go back on the surfing board because he had this uh, kind of piece that allowed him to stick the, you know, the prosthesis onto the board and get his weight up on the board. Um, a girl that wanted to tie a ponytail with one hand, you know, and these different uh, use cases of one product that basically adapts. And, and I think this is a beautiful story of how we can really take these different voices and then create over time, you know, it was a lot of process, a lot of people involved, but create some sort of a harmony and something that uh, even though you have many different needs and, and kind of, you know, uh, many different directions, you can actually create something kind of like mass customized uh, right. for all the users. Yeah. 
Well, and that that mass customization is is something I think you and I, you know, think about a lot. Uh, yeah. Uh, I mean, one of the questions that I wanted to maybe in this conversation we can start it, but I have a feeling like we'll be talking about this for, for a long time. <laughs> is this idea of like, you know, the work that you do and 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 many others across like the world in groups like yours do is is wonderful, but how do we effectively scale? that type of altruism. And, and, and I use that word altruism really specifically because I do want people to, to understand, you know, it, it is what it is. It is the right word, you know? So. That's such a hard question. You know, I was thinking a lot about it and, and, and I think when it comes down to it, uh, we live in a world where we have so many options for everything. You know, you wake up in the morning, you go to the supermarket, you look at the cereal shelf and you have like, you know, 45 different cereals. And then you go to the shoe store and you have, uh, your life is full of choices and options and possibilities. It's overwhelming. And the same goes with, you know, uh, let's say you want to do something altruistic today. You know, you wake up in the morning, you're in the mood to, to help someone or to do something. And you go into, uh, what is it, Microsoft Copilot or <laughs> Google, and you say, oh, how can I, what can I do today, you know, and you type it in, and then it gives you like a list of 100 things. Um, and it's very confusing. It's really hard to really uh, understand how you do something that is not, doesn't just like generate this numbness that you have about everything else that you have so many options about, you know. And I think what's really uh, kind of um, what we both believe in uh, is that the most meaningful human experience is one that connects between people, you know, and allows them to collaborate and to co-create something that actually um, significantly improves one life and possibly many lives. And I think this is where uh, I've seen this uh, idea of scaling altruism or creating this uh, kind of movement of people who really want to do this change, this positive change, uh, because it's really something that is... Uh, um, that, you know, you, you catch, it's kind of like a, a good disease, you know, you, you do it once and then you want to do it again and you experience it. And when it comes to products that serve people in the technological space, um, you know, we both seek to fill that gap between like, you know, all these uh, things that exist out there and the need to create a wide, wide range of options for, you know, the disabled community or for people that have different needs. And this is where I think there's this gap that we try to fill with this altruistic feeling, you know, so right. we both come to work in the morning and we work with individuals from all walks of life and we work with them on finding a way for them to be a part of something that is, you know, so big around us. And once that process starts and you get more people involved and you actually reach this, uh, you know, it sounds very cheesy, I know, um, but it's really true. And I, I really feel like in, previous conversations when we talked about it, um, I sense that, you know, you have the same feeling inside. You really see how this process starts to spark a fire, kind of ignite this passion of seeing how, uh, you know, all these possibilities really creates impact, you know, and it's it, this, right. everything that I talked to about the, the girl that wants to be the engineer and the designer that is all of a sudden like his student project is not just on the shelf or in his you know, in his computer, but it's actually in the community. And all of a sudden his design is being made in Singapore and in other places. And, you know, and it's like a network and it starts kind of working together. And, and I think that the more we have of that and the more we can feed into the system, that's how we scale it. Uh, we also need a methodology and I really believe, and we believe in methodologies and in, in a strategy, you know, so I can tell you what our strategy is. And I would love to hear about your strategy, but I think, you know, kind of the, the passion has to be coupled with a strategy. And our strategy is basically, uh, you know, first of all, the global community, which I think is great to be being really able to work with different communities around the world that share the same passion and to connect them. Because once you have this opportunity to share what you do and what you love with someone who's on the other side of the world, it really is a very meaningful experience for people. Um, the second thing is uh, to create a platform, you know, to create a place where everyone can share their ideas and to really let them grow in that space. So this is very important for us. The, the, the fact that we have the open source element, which is also 
uh, another unique feature of Tom in that kind of assistive tech space a lot of times. It's not because people, a lot of times they say, yeah, it's open source, we don't care, but they don't document it. Where is the design? You know, how do you access it? You know, how do you another, get it made? The program that I really appreciate was, is your emphasis on documentation. Right. So when you kind of couple the, the, the platform and the, the kind of uh, uh, access to the information and to the knowledge uh, and to the methodology of how to develop uh, these products, with the global community, then you start getting into the big numbers. Okay. So you might have a thousand products, but if each product goes to a thousand people and then you start, you know, so this is our strategy and this is how we're hoping to reach, uh, you know, we're just a small nonprofit. We're not Microsoft, but you know, we're hoping to reach, uh, you know, 250 million people is kind of our moonshot vision. And, you know, I think we're headed there. Yeah. I mean, it's such a wonderful answer. And I must admit your answer to that question uh, made the question even bigger for me because what I was thinking about when I asked that question um, was was actually I think much more narrow, which is just how do you get the solutions from these people to everyone? And and you your organization has some really great ways of doing it. I guess I was just thinking if you have that room where there's engineers and and therapists and designers. Um, should there be someone in there that can help you source material? And the reason why I say this is that we would get, we will get startups in assistive technology that come to Microsoft with an idea and it's a great idea. And sometimes the best advice we can give them is, oh, you should go buy this component from here instead of where you're buying it from. And, you know, you should consider this board instead of that board because it's way cheaper and, you know, and better for you. And so having those, that experience here of that of, of being able to not to source parts and to and to maybe like change um, how a solution is kind of made can be really powerful for for people who don't who have great ideas and who have worked with the community but don't necessarily have like the the big system that we have here. So I think that's that's one of the things you know um, that that we've done here in the past. There's a um, you know, that has been really great. And I, I wish we did that more. Yeah, I have to say that that's actually something that is really within our strategy, because one of the things that we emphasize is uh, we're all about frugal innovation. Mm -hmm. We're all about, uh, you know, for us to reach all these people, we have to make sure that our products can be manufactured uh, in Africa, as well as Europe and the States and Asia and everywhere around the world. So we really put emphasis on technologies and materials that are, uh, you know, easily accessible and affordable almost anywhere and international suppliers. And exactly like you said, how do we take a product and we reduce 90% of its costs? You know, the innovation might not be in the design, but actually in the affordability of the product. And so this is our state of mind about everything that we do, starting with like a one-off and then how do we take that and you know, we don't mass produce anything because we're not in the business of mass production and our neglected challenges don't, they don't have a mass market to begin with, which is kind of the irony of things. But at the same time, a lot of times we do find that there's a bigger demand for something, but we need to make it more affordable and more accessible for people, you know? So uh, maybe not everyone has a CNC in their garage, you know, but uh, they have a laser cutter or they have a 3D printer or so it's all about really um, kind of stripping down these uh, the desire. And this is also something that students have, the desire to make something fancy or grand or use crazy materials or source something super unique or do something out of carbon, something, you know, like, a, and really say, no, simple is better. Uh, and simple makes it more scalable, you know, in our world, at least. Um, and the more you get into the digital world, you know, it, it's easier, you know, the booklet talks about augmentation and about really how the form doesn't have to change. And, you know, at first I was thinking, well, how does that work with our approach where we do change forms? But actually, I think it's really clever because what you're really talking about is how you're making inclusive design inherently inclusive by, you know, being able to create all these different features and adjustable methods without actually changing the form and right. so you're really making it accessible to so many more people you know which is really the essence of what it is to make it inclusive right um so this is how we think about things and in a way it's very similar only maybe on different kind of like scales you know 
to- totally. And I think there's some pushes and pulls there that all of us who who make things, you know, kind of especially for this community, kind of struggle with. Like, you know, you might have a you might have someone who like a student who who thinks that their inventions are going to solve um, this disability problem, but it'll make the the life better for everybody, which is a great goal to, to kind of go for. It's one of the foundational pieces of our inclusive design methodology overall, this idea of solve for one and extended to many, but embedded, embedded within that principle of solve for one extended to many is the notion that you have to solve the problem for the person with the permanent disability. And, Mm -hmm. and, you know, this, this quote that I've been living by for, for years has just become so much more relevant in today's sort of technology times. It's by, uh, it's by Mary Pat Rattenberg. She used to work at IBM in the eighties. She used to be a director of accessibility at IBM in the eighties. And she said, for most technology makes things more convenient, but for the disabled, it makes things possible. And that idea, I just, I sit, I almost feel like I need a t-shirt with that quote so that when I go to meet <laughs> and someone goes, Hey, I've got this idea that's going to make things better. And what they usually mean by better is more convenient. And then we have to kind of go, well, how do you take that idea and extend that idea to include people who might be, um, who, who through disability or, or any, quite honestly, any type of marginalization. And how do you, um, how do you take that idea and extend it to them? You know, but, but stall for them primarily, because the reason why we wrote that principle, the way that we did that where we where we explicitly call out permanent disability was way back when we started this work. Um, it was it was really apparent that people would be inspired by um, the disabled and the solutions and the challenges, but they wouldn't. They would kind of go to the more familiar place of like the people that they own. So they would they would take the permanent disability and they would think about the situational limitation, you know, of equivalent. Of you know, so you know, someone with one hand versus like, say someone holding a baby, right? Holding a baby right. effectively one-handed. So they would, they could understand the baby holding part because they could relate to it. Mm-hmm. They couldn't relate yeah. to the one-handedness, which is why we keep having to kind of push people back and go, no, go with your need knowers, make sure you're solving their problems, right? And you can be inspired to extend it, but you, this is the brief, right? The brief is like permanent disability. And, and we, and yeah. it's, it's completely understandable why people who, who don't work um, with the disabled day in and day out, like gravitate towards what's familiar. Um, but for us yeah, as no. entrepreneurs, we have to kind of learn to push them back. I, yeah. And it's very tricky, you know, because we try to, one of the things we try to do through our fellowship program, which is one of the programs I lead, uh, where we train students to lead Tom communities on campus, um, is to teach them empathy. Um, and kind of empathy exercise and, and what it means to, to be disabled or to live with a disability. Um, and it's really tricky because on the one hand, you don't want to create this notion where it's something that's restricting or limiting because people, you know, a lot of disabled people live full and meaningful lives and, and you really don't want to, you know, pigeonhole it as, as, as something, you know, that is restricting. On the other hand, we we are here to, like you said, allow uh, people access to something that many people do have, and it might be such a small thing that will change their lives. And it's a very um, it's a it's a very tight, you know, how do you say tight rope to walk on? Is that the saying, or uh, or I forgot yeah. the you know the idea? But uh, the idea is that we're you know, and we found through kind of trial and error that the best way to do it is really to just create that interaction, you know, talk, experience, talk together, um, you know, um, just, you know, be there. Uh, because like you said, it's really hard. You can't, you know, um, you can't, you know, step into someone's shoes if you don't have their whole life experience, you know, just tying someone's hand behind their back to feel like what it's like to be amputated doesn't work, you know, because they have a whole life experience that, you know, is attached to, to, what's going on and this is something you can't just teach or you know reflect on in five minutes you really have to just be there in that space and experience it you know and that's the best way to do it and i think that through the processes we create um you see that happening more and more you see really how um 
sometimes students are very kind of afraid of that space of interacting with a person with disabilities or, you know, they don't want to insult them or say something wrong or, and all, you know, and all they say is just like, just be, you know, you don't have to think about that, you know, we're just people and we're talking here. And, and that is such an important lesson to teach them in any interaction they do, but specifically here when they're trying to design for someone else who they have no idea what they're experiencing, you know? Um, and, you know, I, I would love to hear about how, how you guys deal with it, but, you know, I think it's fascinating. I, I appreciate what you're saying there. And I, I agree. I will tell you personally in the practice that I do here, and this isn't, this isn't Microsoft, this is me, right? Mm -hmm. I actually don't, I actually discourage this idea of empathy. And I know you didn't mean it this way as putting yourself in someone else's shoes. And the reason why I do that is in this instance, like with the, my colleagues, like it's, it's a pretty big leap for a lot of them to go into these shoes. And I don't expect them to be able to do it. And what tends to kind of happen is they take the emotion and the like of the, of the situation and they try to contextualize the, the experience in their head. And then it doesn't quite meet the same. So like, like to give you an example, um, you know, one of the things that we always talked about in Xbox for a really long time is this idea of um, this idea that, you know, people, we know how much money our, our target audience makes, like the vast majority of them make. And you have to always kind of remind your fellow employees that like, we're not in the same income bracket. So yeah, you can buy a game for, you know, and just to try it out, but like the other people who, who, who we kind of depend on don't, they don't have that kind of discretionary income that you have. So when you would try to get them to empathize, they would, they'd feel like, well, I don't have the discretionary income to buy that second car I wanted. And we're like, that's not the same thing. <laughs> you know, right. You know, right. Like, so so that's, that's what's different, I think, about our practice. And again, I mean, I'm being very specific. Like, I really yeah. do try to bring people in to meet people with disabilities and to hear, and to hear like, from their voice, like, what they're actually saying and to really kind of contextualize it. I don't necessarily try to get people to, to feel that emotion in, in many ways. I, I want them to care. I want them to be compassionate and I want them to go do something. But. I'm not trying to like tell them to be in someone else's shoes that, but I, right. that that's how I've no, And I think, no, no. And I think you're, uh, you're right. And in, in the sense that it's just impossible at the end of the day, you know, it's impossible. And, uh, uh, I think maybe also it's not the right approach. Uh, it's more about feeling comfortable in that space and kind of, um, you know, accepting the fact that, you will not have all the knowledge and experience and possibility to really be in someone else's shoes. But at the same time, you can create a, a meaningful connection that will allow you to understand certain things better than you do currently, you know? Yeah, absolutely. Um, this has been a wonderful conversation and I really appreciated your insight and, and your time here. Is there anything that you want to bring up kind of before we go? There's so many things, but I think, you know, uh, well, we can do this. We again. don't have all day. Right. <laughs> I, I did want, you know, something we spoke about earlier that we didn't get to talk about now. And I just wanted to quickly bring up is, you know, the uh, idea that you brought before of, uh, you know, mass production and, mm -hmm. and how, uh, you know, we both emphasize uh, customization and, uh, this thought that I had, uh, about how actually, you know, how, uh, we're reaching where we are right now, you know, because um, basically, you know, you, you saw that the industrial revolution is what allowed uh, these uh, industries and this industrial manufacturing to come about and create mass production, right? At the same time, nowadays, you see that these technologies are helping us create mass customization. So it's actually going and taking us back to this era where we're able to do something that's more tailor-made for the needs of the people that we work with uh, because we're using these uh, technologies that are so advanced and that came out of this uh, idea of, you know, creating manufacturing in an easier and more accessible way. And this is something we really believe in, you know, distributed manufacturing, mass customization, allowing us to reach more people in a place, if, if, you know, once upon a time you were in rural 
in Canada, in rural Canada, and you had to drive all the way to the center um, to buy something, you know. These days, you can just step into your garage or go to the local, I don't know, library and, and get something printed on a 3D printer and you have it instead of ordering it and waiting for two months or driving. So, you know, access and the globalization and the, uh, the industrial revolution, it's actually helping us be more, uh, you know, tailor-made. And, and at, at the same time that we're, you know, moving into this era of, you know, mass production and all these options, it's also helping us really go back to uh, the ability to uh, put more emphasis on the individual and create uh, customizations that will fit a wide range of abilities. And I think that's something really beautiful that we see the circle or kind of, you know, uh, process happening. I, I love your take on that, mostly because I try to be positive, but you're much more, <laughs> which is, which is great. You know, I must admit like in my dark times, I lament basically the, the creation of mass production is the introduction of systemic ableism, you know? And I think it's, there's, it's fair to think about like how, how those two things can kind of co coexist. Your take on it is, is much more forward thinking and positive. And I, I, I'm going to start using your take. <laughs> so. No problem. I'm always here to, to put a positive, uh, you know, if you can't fight them, join them. Don't they say right. that? <laughs> well, and, and, and again, like, you know, the, the work that you do and that your organization does shows the, the path to that vision. Right. And I think, I think it's something that hopefully you know, as we, as we, as a community start to like work together, we can get other industrial designers. You know, I know we didn't talk about software. We can talk about software some other time, but just people who make physical things to kind of, to, to sort of have new different values. Um, I must admit, I do like to rib my, um, my industrial design colleagues when, when they ask me, what's your job? I kind of go, well, my job is to make sure your forms don't impede human function. Right. <laughs> That's right. So, um, you know, but, but I think we're going to get there. Um, Ayan, this was Absolutely. so great to talk to you today. And I really appreciate it's great. it. Great. Thank you. We, we should do this more often. So let's do this more often. Absolutely.